You're listening to Think in Translation, a literary podcast from Vagabond Voices in Glasgow. The series is made up of conversations with international authors, translators, publishers, and booksellers with the aim of making translated books more accessible. Episodes air every second Thursday. This week's guest is Angie Crawford. Angie is the Scottish buying manager at Waterstones. She discusses Gaelic and Scots writing, how literature in each language is now being received, and the difference between the Orkney Gruffalo and the Dundonian Gruffalo. My name's Angie Crawford and I'm the Scottish buying manager at Waterstones Bookseller. So my favourite work of translated Scots, and I'm talking about pieces of work that have been translated into Scots, if that makes sense, is actually a bit of a funny one. It's the Doric Gruffalo. One of the reasons that I love it is that I have always understood that Scots was part of our heritage and our language, but I didn't really think about the various nuances that we have within the Scots language or dialect. And when I read the Doric Gruffalo and I compared it to the Gruffalo in Scots, it was was very interesting in in a way that I hadn't expected it to. And it made me really think about the different dialects that we have in Scotland and the what that says about the people and the the landscape around the country. For example, um, the Doric Ruffalo starts, A mist took a donder, bend the wood, a tod saw the mist, and the mist looked good. Come a wee bit farer, into the own deep murk wood, and fin out, if it happens, fin the, slick at mist faz, in we a hula, a snake, and a hungry Gruffalo. Now, that was my first introduction to the word fit like, I didn't understand what that was or what that meant. And coming from up north or in the highlands of Scotland, I was I, I couldn't understand that. But it just means fit like, what do you like? And comparing that to the Scots, the Gruffalo and Scots, it's a moose took a donor through the deep mitquid, a Todd saw the moose and the moose looked good. Come a wee bit further into the deep mitquid, and find out what happens when the sleek at moose comes face to face with a hulet, a snake, and a hungry gruffalo. So when you're reading it, it, it doesn't sound massively different, but there's just that little bit that's softer around the edges and just creates a sense of something that's quite different. And I think with this particular translation, or translations, you get it in the Orkney Gruffalo, the Dundonian Gruffalo, the Glaswegian Gruffalo. I think you get one for the Shet- that's the Shetland Gruffalo as well. And I find that it was because it's such a well-known story that many of us with kids could pretty much recite. To hear those gentle uh, nuances are really interesting. I can understand some Gaelic. I'm actually from the Western Isles um, in Lewis, the Isle of Lewis on the west coast of Scotland. So I was brought up in Gaelic. I was taught in Gaelic. But I've been away from the island for such a long time, more than half of my life, and none of my relatives are alive on the island. So that ability to read and certainly talk in it has diminished over the years although when I do go back once a year it's funny how you understand the language even though if you know if you ask me to to read something just now I wouldn't be able to in the in the way that I might have once been able to. For many years I think Scots as a language was very much neglected and overlooked both um, culturally, but also in our education system. And I think, thinking about Gaelic, I'm a great example of someone who comes from the islands and I am bringing up a family who are not living on that island. And my relatives, who did once upon a time speak Gaelic, are no longer with us. So that, that is being lost throughout the generations. And I do think that having... Scots and Gaelic in the written form is a great way to keep that going. So I know myself with my children that although they're not taught in Gaelic, I can ta- you know do some like, spot goes to school in, in Gaelic with them, for example. And that's the, one of the first books that I read in Gaelic. And I think that's 
you are passing something down which is incredibly important. Gaelic is predominantly an oral language. A lot of traditions, um, music, cutting the peats, uh, walking the tweed. You would sing and talk, in, in Gaelic you would have um, rhymes that are, you, you talk you, over and over. And I think up north, if you went to a Cayley, which we traditionally see as a when everyone does Cayley dancing, but really it would be um, gathering in somebody's living room over a dram and having storytelling in the Gaelic. And books, because it, that was a very strong oral tradition, particularly up in the Highlands and the west coast of Scotland, having it written down helps keep that going, if that makes sense, so that even though you don't live on the island or you're not part you know where your family are you can still have a little bit of that and I think I was thinking about that earlier today and when you think about the Scottish diaspora and how many Scots people are spread around the world and you look at places like Nova Scotia in Canada Australia New Zealand America Gaelic in some of those places is more used as a language than we do in Scotland so in a way it's helping people be true to their own identity and who they are and where they come from and I think that's also really interesting because when I go back home to Stornoway one of the first things people always ask you if I have friends with me who are your people who you know where are you from and as soon as they hear that they're able to put to make connections or try and understand you better. So I guess, you know, touched on earlier about culture, and I am very much a chuchter, somebody from um, up north, but, you know, in in Scotland, and certainly in the tradition of translation of um, books into Scots, I think back to some of the best-known Scottish writers, you know, Robert Burns, Robert Louis Stevenson, Hugh McDermott, even contemporary writers like Liz Lockhead and Irvin Welsh or Anne Donovan, they're writing in Scots. So, you know, it helps you understand what they're writing about and and how that culturally resonates with us living in Scotland, which I think is really important. And also, I guess, there is a sense of pride that it is enough for for these books to be translated into these I guess, very old languages. But it also, I suppose, helps us keep learning and reading and enjoying um, in Gaelic or indeed Scots, which I think is really important so that it's not seen as something that we have to do, but that we actually enjoy reading and writing in those languages. Something that I haven't really mentioned that one of that I am particularly proud of, and I'm sure any sort of... Gaelic speaker will tell you is that Gaelic is a very beautiful language even if you can't understand it it is very very beautiful to listen to and if you can listen to it and understand it and then being able to read it out loud I think that is a a real attraction as well and I guess in forms of narrative fiction or non-fiction that possibly is a bit more challenging but in terms of poetry or shorter works of fiction, I think it can be very beautiful to listen to. You have um, a lot of autobiographical works in Gaelic. You get a lot of local history in Gaelic as well. And that's people who enjoy reading these genres and perhaps aren't given to fiction reading in the same way. So perhaps an older readership. But then you also have um, poetry because... I mean, a lot of Gaelic is very musical. There's, you have poetry and you also have music uh, and songwriting in the Gaelic. But music and poetry are very... If you're learning Gaelic, it is actually easier to, to follow and to take small pieces and unlearn that and translate it rather than reading um, a work of fiction. And then by extension of that, there is not an explosion, but a very strong market for English books or any uh, book being translated into Gaelic because you are um, reaching that readership who are perhaps their parents 
don't speak Gaelic, but they want their kids to be able to learn and speak in Gaelic. So I think there is a, a bit in the middle that isn't so easily accessible in Gaelic. And I guess that comes down to basically money as well, that how much it costs to translate a work of fiction, especially new fiction, compared to um, a shorter book like some poetry or picture books as a good example of that. In Scots, though, it's quite a different picture for a translation in that certainly when I was at school, Scots was very much looked down upon as not the Queen's English. And it wasn't, it was seen as slang. You didn't speak in Scots, perhaps um, in the way that we do now. I mean, I have to contextualise that by saying I am from up north, so Scots isn't as um, popular um, as it is in the central belt. I live in Fife now, and Scots is, is very uh, prominent as a, a way of speaking. But I think over the last 15 years, Scots has been very much introduced to the Scottish curriculum and is a very important part of the way and also what children are learning at school. As a result of that, we are seeing a lot more books uh, translated into Scots from other languages. And I guess one of the things that really makes Scots stand out is not just its expressiveness, if that, if I can use that, um, it's also that it's extremely funny to listen to. And when I touched on how Gaelic is you know, used all over the world, where you find Scottish people, Scots, you find that a lot of people will send Scots books to family in the other in other parts of the world because, not even just because it's a sort of memento of Scotland, but it's actually a very funny book to read. And we've had, I guess, most recently, Harry Potter in Scots, which was pretty much one of the top books um, for Christmas in Scotland. And people were buying that not because they wanted to read it in Scots, but because they genuinely find it a fun way of reading. And I think Scots brings that to the table in the way that maybe other languages don't. And I think there is expression in in Scots that you just think, wow, that is that is really that is that is just exactly what I was meaning to say. <laughs> you know, I think of words like Galaica is a really great example of that because it means just being a bit dopey and I can't think of another word that really hits that the way that um, the word glicket does. In a world increasingly where there's uniformity and that everything is so accessible that having individuality um, becomes more important. And I think that people look around and are very, they're proud of their roots and where they come from and what they stand for. And I think that makes genuinely people think about you know, what their language is and, and how it has been built. You know, I think in Gaelic there's definitely an active desire for some people who, who aren't Gaelic speakers themselves and really want their families to speak in Gaelic and be able to interact in Gaelic culture. I think in Scots it's a gentler approach because you know, you can pretty much work Scots out without having to learn a language, but it's very much that it speaks of our identity and where we are from, and it's also very enjoyable. And it helps us understand, you know, that it was, it was the language of our, you know, of our royal families and how expressions of literature in Scots, and I think that's a really important historical um, fact as well. My experience of Gaelic is that Gaelic is, it can be very localised. So Gaelic in, for example, the Isle of Skye will be, uh, will have some differences and nuances compared to in Lewis or even Harris. Um, and then, though again, comparing that to Glasgow, it will be a little bit different again. So I think it's always evolving as well, and that makes it quite um difficult to get a handle on. Um, in Scots, I'm not so sure. I think it is just, it's very, it's very localised and you do get very marked 
dialects and versions that when we touched on earlier about children's translations that I think as a bookseller when we saw translations of books in different dialects within Scots you know, I really didn't understand the need for that until I started reading them and saw the marked difference um, depending on the part of Scotland that the, that um, language came or dialect came from and I think that is that is quite interesting but I don't think it's evolving in the same way as Gaelic I've bought books in Scotland um, as a retailer for nearly 11 years and I think what I think one of the most interesting things has been the translation and passion for books in Scots. It has it's it's really amazing to see that it's not just I I can't remember when there's a publisher called It Chiku who specialise in, in Scots translations for children I think that must have started about 15 years ago and in book selling you're always looking for that crystal in the crystal ball to see what's going to ha- you know be the next big thing and I think if you'd asked us 10 years ago oh you know it's possibly a bit of a fad but it's not the the um, integration of learning in Scots and about Scots in the, within the Scottish curriculum has been celebrated and as young people are growing up they're using that in their own language and they need books to, to do that as well and so it's very p- much part of our culture and you know, our, I guess with, in any bookshop that you go to in Scotland you will find an area of books that are in um, in Scots, and actually I say that, but in some shops you would just find that integra- integrated into sort of general run of books because there are so many of them and that it's so part of our day-to-day life in a way that it wasn't before. That I think that's one of the things that's really surprised me and even seeing how some books can still top the charts because they're translated into Scots is quite remarkable. Thanks for listening to Think in Translation. The show is made possible by the support of the space and Creative Scotland. For more information about Vagabond Voices and Think in Translation, including blog posts exploring translation from various angles, visit vagabondvoices.co.uk. Our music, Quid Meta, is written and performed by Matthew Hyde in this quintet. The show is produced and edited by Alex Block.